Well, first of all, compliments to our predecessors for a, a very stimulating uh, morning. Um, as Judith said, this, uh, she gave one example of how this session is going to be different because um, we don't have any PowerPoints. Uh, I think we're going to be different in a couple other ways, too, structure and timing. What we're going to try to do is open with five-minute presentations, and I've been at five, six, okay, seven, uh, <laughs> but I've been asked to really try to keep it to that, uh, and I will uh, try to keep it to that. And... Um, and then what we're going to try to do uh, is maybe have a little engagement between the panelists themselves after reaction, giving everyone their chances to have first reaction to other speakers if they want to do that and engage that way, and then open it up. Uh, so this session, we hope, will have much more opportunity uh, for, for the, those who are present here uh, to ask. And, and not only questions, we're going to welcome uh, comments as well. You know, not that usual formula where don't pretend it's a question and make a comment. You can make comments, but we're going to uh, stay to the, try, try to keep them to about a minute uh, in length so that we don't um, have a, a lot more time taken up that way. Um, we're also going to be, or at least I, I've suggested to the group in earlier conversations, a little more reflective um, about ourselves, about our experiences here uh, than uh, most of the uh, speakers at the beginning, although Gary began his presentation the way he began. I don't see him here right now, but um, his coming here and what that meant. And, and we'll perhaps have more of that. Uh, going on as well. And then another difference is going to be the um, role of the moderator, because I'm not going to take the chance that Dennis took of going last and not having time. Uh, <laughs> so I'm going to go first. Uh, <laughs> And I'm also going to try to function more as an as a active moderator, as, as I've been asked to do, to keep people on time and to get the audience, the group, uh, more involved in themselves. So what I'm going to do uh, with the uh, few minutes now that I have is to um, uh, talk a bit um, about what I hope will be part of the content for others. And uh, so I'll be talking about the session a bit and doing that, but then kind of doing, doing it myself as well, too. And as I said, what, what we're looking for here is something more reflective. This is uh, not just an arbitrary moment in time when we all find ourselves together in this room. Uh, but if any of us can believe it, it is the 50th anniversary of our graduation uh, from this institution. Um, I don't totally believe it. I, in the abstract, I do, but to think of, of, of what that means. But here it is. And it is a moment kind of for taking stock, for a little self-reflection, um, life journey kind of uh, introspection, it seems to me, uh, and to look back uh, what being here meant to us, did for us um, professionally, how it helped shape uh, professions and careers, as we've been talking about it, but also personally. Uh, kind of uh, prepared us for the life uh, that we've lived, for the world that we found ourselves in, a world of change, always has been, started being noticed that way a couple hundred years ago, maybe, but it's definitely that, and we know it is that, and in the way that that's happening, and in a way contributing, but how, how did our kind of grounding and life here and education here prepare us for that and for the decades uh, that have followed? For me, uh, I've long regarded uh, the years I spent here as deeply formative. Uh, like Gary, as I said, who spoke this morning, made me think of it. I also grew up in Chicago in a Chicago public high school, not one named after any of the former presidents of this institution. Um, <laughs> But came here, and it really was a kind of eye-opening experience. Uh, you know, all the cliches apply to life of the mind, um, the intellectual caliber not of, of those who were teaching us and of one another, frankly. I definitely value deeply and benefited from the uh, mutuality of being together uh, with people that you really could engage, could talk, there the, the excitement of ideas. Um, there was something about that that, that really came to me and, and struck me and, and stayed with me uh, in that way. And, it, and, and the, the people that, that did teach us, um, the kind of participation in the classroom, the way classroom instruction uh, went on, uh, th that kind of engagement, and relationships out of the classroom, not only with one another, but even with the people uh, who were, were teaching us. I discovered, I think I valued it more later, and in later years I really increasingly did come to, to deeply value that. 
Uh, in terms of myself and career, um, I've had two of them, and the first one was uh, shaped here. I was so uncertain of where I was going that I found a degree program where you didn't even have to pick a major. It was general studies in the humanities uh, that we were told then was the first interdisciplinary degree granting program. Um, and it was terrific, and I did end up then uh, going to one of the disciplines to English, a person who probably had the most influence on me, and that was Norman McLean, um, who's you know, fame as a teacher has continued. I remember one point when I had gone on and gotten my PhD and was teaching, um, came back and met with him and told him that, and uh, said how my, he had been the greatest influence I felt on that career choice. And he said the last person who came and saw him and said he had influenced their career choice was somebody selling insurance. <laughs> and, and the influence had been quite the opposite of, uh, of, of, my, of using him as a model. But there, you know, there were, there were, you know, the, 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 the sense of the people we were with and uh, the way we were with them. And then, but then also, as I say, the ideas, going to texts, going to the original texts, going deeply into them. Um, I, for me, I did feel it, it kind of gave a grounding, whatever we did, not just the professional, but, but for life, of, um, of the verities, of, of uh, this sense of, of, of where there is permanence, not only the method of thinking, but the nature of ideas that we were exposed to when we got in the original and that did ground us, and I felt, at least for myself, prepared us uh, in, in important ways for the life and that followed for us personally, for the world that we found ourselves in. So I made a, a, a career change and ended up getting more into this public policy arena, that, which is the subject of this session, Law, Public Policy, and Society. And uh, where I found myself uh, getting involved is in um, Jewish communal service, as it's called, a Jewish communal professional. Uh, and that's what I've been doing. But even in that, I found both the tools and the approaches uh, that w came from here uh, useful, and, and even in doing some scholarship. And the direction my scholarship has taken me, and I just in the past couple of days thought of this in anticipation of this and, and had thoughts that were new to me. Um, is in the field of, uh, of anti-Semitism. That's where I've been doing more research and publishing recently and realized, you know, I thought of when we were here, when we were here, it was uh, less than 15 years since the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. You know, again, I, this is a thing that keeps happening to me is going back and reconstructing the past and comparing time frames and how, how far apart things were. And, you know, we had been kids when that happened, and then we were young adults and maturing, and it was in the past. Um, but I, I don't think I ever thought how close in the past uh, it was. And then I've thought, been thinking these days, again, of, of the people who taught us and what that meant. And I looked up a couple of them. I did, Google is wonderful. Uh, and uh, did some quick research on some of them and found you know, how many of them had had experiences where they survived or fled earlier, or their families moved, or one way or the other. Uh, Jack Weintraub, another notable uh, teacher that many of us had for uh, history of Western Civ, um, had been one such uh, person. And by the way, even saying that and give us, I remember, I remember uh, getting a paperback from him where that's how he signed, he signed it, graded it, and signed it. And I, and that led me to thinking uh, how we even regarded the word professor. We talk about professors and so on. We didn't go to school. We went to school. That's not how the people who taught us were regarded. <coughs> It was Mr. Mrs. What a, those of us who did Russian, it was Gospoda. Uh, and, um, and, and that's how we related. And they, you know, they, now it's not as these days things are so familiar. In some cases, just first names. He signed it with the first name and last name. But it was that level of intimacy as well as distance of respect of who they were that we had. But people coming from that experience, I, another friend of mine had Leo Strauss. I mean, these are the kind of people uh, we had. But you look up their experiences, Bruno. Bettelheim was here. Um, the final person I'll remember is Gerhard Meyer for Soch, for Soch 3. Um, some of us, um, I know Richard Ratner was on the list of who's coming. I don't know if he's here yet, and we'll see him. I remember there were a few of us that lived in apartments, and he and uh, we were close with his apartment mates. We had Gerhard Meyer came for dinner. He set up a dinner where he came and uh, talked personally. He was not Jewish. 
but his wife was, and he talked about that, and that's why they left Germany. Is at the Frankfurt School? I mean, these can the kind of people, but he, he came, you know, so these people were there. That, that was what we had then, and then we thought we were in a different era, and uh, anti-Semitism was more just of the past, but it's around out there in the world right now again, so I said talking, just touching on work I'm doing now in, uh, in this realm of society and public policy. It still touches, and, and being here, I'm thinking of those people and of that kind of collapsing as well as expanding the sense of time and thinking what having exposure with people like that, what it meant, uh, is a powerful experience. So being together, uh, us together for this reunion and being able to be here together and to enjoy it and celebrate together, I think, is, 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 is a wonderful thing. And uh, we'll hear now uh, from um, the, our panel here. You've got their their bios. Um, I'm going to do even less in terms of introduction and let each of them, uh, when they start, um, identify themselves the way they want to be identified at this moment in time and of career and, uh, and, and share their, their minutes with us and then we will engage the way I said. Thank you. While I was at the luncheon uh, with Dean Bauer, I wrote down a few notes. Uh, for what I want to say now. And um, so that's how quickly I worked on this. And I really do have to say that I really enjoyed this morning uh, because uh, it was so obvious that the people who presented had spent a lot of time on trying to prepare and really anticipating that they could cover uh, 50 years in, in a few minutes. And of course you can. And, um, but I, so I'm going to start at this point in time and tell you that I'm in the process now of writing uh, my memoir because I have retired from uh, the University of Pennsylvania in June of 2011, and that's why I am celebrating my retirement here because I really, uh, next to my family, this is a group of people that I have known the longest in my life. And I would be very honored if uh, you are able to just stop by uh, on uh, Saturday uh, evening at the uh, museum. So you're all welcome. And I uh, did that because I wanted to do it, because um, I uh, do uh, respect uh, this institution and the value of a quality education. As a girl from the hood, I was obviously uh, looking for role models in the city of Chicago, growing up on the south side, going to Inglewood High School. And um, I encountered at that time a teacher by the name of Marjorie Steptoe who had, thank you very much, who had uh, worked at the lab school before she came over to Inglewood High School. And uh, she taught modern dancing uh, to us, so we learned all about uh, Martha Graham, Sybil Shearer, uh, uh, Pearl Premis, and most importantly, Catherine Dunham, most importantly for me. And I discovered that Catherine Dunham had a PhD from the University of Chicago, and it was in, um, anthropology, and I thought uh, that that was a PhD, and I thought it was absolutely wonderful that she had uh, gotten her uh, this uh, degree in, in um, anthropology and had lent that to her work in the performing arts and uh, so forth, and I thought the meshing of the two was absolutely wonderful and I wanted to be that. Well, when I got here, I discovered that in terms of what I expected, what I thought I was getting versus what I got, um, I discovered that you only had to practice twice a week to take the modern dance class, and of course, my mother, uh, who raised me had used that as a birth control measure, and I was working out about three to four hours a day, five to six days a week in my dance because it was a very serious endeavor, and I always approached everything in that way. At any rate, to make a long story uh, a shorter, I since they weren't obviously serious about dance at Chicago, I dropped it, and uh, but. <clears throat> I still uh, continued with the idea that I had gotten about Dunham's career and um, uh, started uh, looking into areas that were of interest to me, and of course that, was, that became human development. Now, I thought at the time, here once again, that I was going to be a, a clinical psychologist, 
And um, I, uh, but, and I will make that story short. I went to graduate school for that. What I'm saying is that I entered the college with the idea that I was going on to graduate school. And as you all know, in those days, by the time you were in your third year, you took classes with graduate students. And when you saw how you could do so much better than them, you knew you were on the right track to go on to graduate school, whether you chose to go at that point or not. You were doing, you know. So I went on to graduate school. And uh, I thought I was going to be a clinical psychologist. And then in 1965, the Head Start program uh, broke. And I uh, got very interested in uh, uh, what has now become an area, a sub-area, called uh, child development and social policy. Uh, but at the time, it just simply meant that Head Start as a program was the very first and original child development and social policy uh, program in the country. So uh, for low these many years, uh, I have been working in some aspect of that for the past a number of years. Now, in order to, to uh, accomplish the rest of this in the next two and a half minutes, I will have to shift quickly and just talk about two areas that are, have been of interest to me. Um, and I have to say that one of the reasons I enjoyed my career so much is that I lived through the interests of my students. I didn't have um, children of my own, and so my students, in, in effect, became my children, and I was very interested in what they were doing, and it was almost like having another arm with someone to do things. For example, Dr. Zhang, who's here, would you mind just standing and waving your hand? She's the only not old person in the room. <laughs> <laughs> she um, took her PhD. I was on her committee at... Um, the University of Pennsylvania a couple of years ago, and she was very interested in using large data sets to look at problems that uh, have to do with uh, classroom composition, if you will, and, and uh, poor and minority kids in those classrooms and the effect on their achievement and their mental health. Well, I came through doing an era where these large data sets that you could learn to use were not available, so that's a whole new set of enterprises, and it requires considerably more sophisticated than I ever had, and I'm very respectful of uh, her uh, talents. The uh, second kind of project that I want to uh, mention is having to do with um, my uh, uh, probably my last book of this type, which any of you who are interested in getting a copy of it, just put your name on a piece of paper. This is uh, entitled Racial Stereotyping in Child Development. And most of the writers in here are uh, students uh, or former students of mine, uh, one of whom uh, is happily now on the, in the now uh, Department of uh, Comparative Human Development. Uh, she has an endowed chair there, Dr. Margaret Beale Spencer. She She's also one of my uh, former students and a good friend since we're a little closer in age than me and Dr. Zhang. But <laughs> at any rate, um, I have enjoyed my career uh, working with them. Uh, I should say a little bit about uh, how I would see the changes in this particular arena over the last uh, uh, 50 years, because it certainly was a question for me during my time in the college that none of these issues were tackled by any of my professors. Uh, I uh, never had a professor who addressed uh, in my college years the totality of the kind of familial and community and cultural experiences that I had. I can't cite any. I had some wonderful professors, but it was like going to a foreign country and experiencing a different culture, which, since I've been traveling all my life, and some of you know that, I've even met you on travels, I like going to different cultures and different communities and so forth. And that's the way I approach the university. But there still were many unanswered questions that took me from college um, you know, into graduate school. And some of them were unanswered because I couldn't tackle them myself, myself for a lot of reasons. And some were just unanswered, period. One of them, of course, is the impact of uh, race and racial stereotyping on the development of children. And so uh, finally, at the very end of my career, I'm very proud that we actually, uh, I can tell you in a nutshell, literally in the next minute, what things were like at the beginning 50 years ago and what they are like uh, now. Uh, in the beginning, there was thought to be, in this particular field, the equation of self-concept on the one hand and racial attitudes 
needs and preferences on the other, so that how you thought about your race was supposed to be connected in some way. The assumption was to how you thought about yourself as an entire person. And what has happened in the empirical sciences in psychology over the past uh, 50 years uh, is to aggressively disentangle uh, those two connections. So we now see the possibility and understand that dep depending upon the adaptation of the particular individual, uh, you can literally have high in-group or low in-group uh, uh, in preferences and at the same time feel very confident and so forth about your, yourself as a uh, person. So uh, the, with the disentanglement of self-concept on the one hand and racial attitudes and preferences on the other, it's now possible and basically to start looking into issues of, um, well, what does it matter what your racial attitudes are in relation to a whole variety of things, not just self-concept, but for example, your response to uh, media your, and how you tackle those issues, uh, your response to, uh, as in the case of this book to the sense of whether you have ability to do math and so forth and so on. So um, I, I see a bright future in that. There's also, secondly and finally, uh, the issue in the matter of um, uh, we still haven't addressed Africa because we now know at this point in time, 2012, that whether you're a member of a majority culture or a minority culture, so to speak, uh, that in and of itself does not predict uh, um, what your response will be to the racial attitudes and uh, preferences. And uh, just uh, to show you, um, in 2010, the first international conference of the Society for Behavioral Development finally had a conference for the first time in uh, uh, Zambia on the continent of Africa, and yours truly, of course, was there. Uh, the last uh, uh, author in this book who gave a talk there, uh, 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 Dr. Bami Insamini, um, uh, talks about this whole issue of here you have basically uh, a majority uh, black continent on the one hand and at the same time his concern about stereotypes as it projects onto the children of that continent. So I like to feel, whether it's true or not, that I and the colleagues that I work with, some of whom will be at the reception tonight, uh, and the demographics as a whole in the country as a whole, have contributed to actually making a, a, a sea change in uh, the um, um, perceptions and the understanding of the need to continue to research race and racial stereotypes in this country. Thank you very much. Uh, my um, resume is laid out on the uh, material you have, and I see no particular reason to add to it. Um, unlike some on this panel, I am not retired. I belong to a profession in which if it, it's such a good job that you usually leave it feet first. <laughs> uh, Dick Posner, who was on the faculty of the law school, still is, did a piece, a book called Aging in Old Age. And he, he noted that there was evidence, I can't remember all of them because I didn't care about all of them, but there are certain professions that you can actually not only do as well as you age, that you did when you were younger, you can actually get better. And the three I remember were historians, <clears throat> literary critics, which was kind of a surprise, <laughs> and judges. Um, so I, I'm relying on that. I, 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 I do want to uh, note uh, four faculty members I had here and their influence on me. And all of them came uh, in the first year. And, and I think for many people, it's, the, it's the, the first scholars you encountered, the first teachers that have the greatest influence on you, even if you don't recognize it. And sometimes you won't recognize it because you went on to academic studies, you got a PhD in a variety of other things, and you tend to think that your thesis advisor or your mentor had a tremendous influence, and of course they did. But for most of us, the thing that changed you, even if you don't remember it, was your first year. Mm -hmm. um, 
Uh, as far as my attending the University of Chicago, I was the 19th member of my family to graduate from the University of Chicago. <laughs> there, and all of them from the north side, incidentally. Um, and there were some after me as well. So I, I, it wasn't exactly choice, a free choice, <laughs> that, that I went to the University of Chicago. But um, I, I'm glad I, I didn't uh, have the, uh, I, I didn't uh, have really have a choice. <laughs> uh, I'm going to mention four professors, although one, I, I, I think it was John Coelty, but I'm not sure about his first name. John, yes. John well, that's good. Um, and he, t he showed me something not necessarily terribly important in and of itself, but it was a big revelation to me. Uh, at, at that stage of my life, I inherited from my mother this uh, uh, enormous interest in jazz. And I was playing the trumpet, and I was a devoted reader of Downbeat a magazine and a bunch of other jazz critics, and there were a few then. Um, but I never understood what they were saying. I just, I, it was like a mystery to me. It was the hieroglyphics. And they had nice words about tuning and tone and chord structure and a variety of other things that meant absolutely nothing. And I finally realized when I, and I had Coelty and he went through the music part that it wasn't my fault. <laughs> because he taught me that you could actually speak coherently about music. And then when I understood how you speak coherently about music, I canceled my subscription to Downbeat. <laughs> um, uh, two other faculty members didn't stay here very long. One was Robert Palter, who taught history and philosophy of the physical sciences. Um, I liked him very much because he was teaching about something where you could actually come close to knowing. And he, he kept emphasizing coming close to knowing. He didn't say, and the emphasis was always on close. It was not on actually knowing. Um, and, and it had a big influence on me. Uh, and then I had a first year course with somebody who went on to a fairly substantial career in philosophy, a woman named Mary Mothersill. Um, who taught me about the meaning of executing on an idea. I had an idea, it was a difficult philosophical problem, and like most philosophical problems, not yet solved. Um, and I had an idea that the way you could approach defining something was defining it by what it was not, as opposed to what it is. I am not the first person to think of this. <laughs> it felt like I was the first person to think of it at the time. And I wrote what I thought was a very good paper, and she thought it was a very good paper, too. But um, the point she made, and she taught this to me, in the context of that one paper, which is the second one I wrote in that class, that you have this nice idea, but you have to execute it fully. It's not a little insight that you can follow up here and make an interesting observation about this, that, or the other thing. You have to carry it to its absolute end. In which case, you might find that you think you're riding on this galloping stallion from, uh, from darkness to the light of truth. But it is possible you're riding on a hobby horse, because it sort of feels the same way. Uh, and, I, and I kept that with me. The, the most influential in terms of what I've done in my life was Abram Lincoln Harris, um, uh, who taught uh, the Soch three or Soch two, I can't remember what. And he was a very colorful guy. He was a devoted communist for a number of years and uh, lost faith in the Communist Party. Um, and, and those of you might possibly remember that when he came here as freshman in 1958 or 59, there were a significant number of the entering students who were communists. They believed in communism. And the thing I remember about Harris, he was absolutely brutal with them. He, is, he just tore them from limb to limb, probably much more harshly than he had to do. Uh, he was a very colorful guy. I attribute his harshness. I wouldn't have done this at the time, but now that I have passed my, I am into my, uh, uh, my eighth decade, uh, I now realize that a part of that had to do with his age, because I have noticed that I have become crabby. 
Many of you have probably become crabby. And it's not a particularly good thing to be a crabby judge. So I avoid being crabby, but it takes conscious effort to do that. And, and Harris, I think, was brutal because he was crabby. It's, 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 it's like the, um, the, the 250th student who thought uh, that um, uh, from each according to his ability and to each according to his needs was a really good idea. Um, and, and, and he made a difference uh, for me uh, because uh, all of these lessons uh, are basically good for our subject, which is law, public policy, and society. Um, because what it made me into was a skeptic, and I'm still a skeptic. Uh, if you take a look, for, I'll just give you one quick example of uh, this emphasis that we have today, and have had for many years. Uh, we have a problem, pass a law. Um, it doesn't really work very well. I, I can think of a very small number of laws that have changed public policy. And one of them is a very trivial thing. It wasn't very grand. In the 1880s, 1890s, the United States was flooded with immigrants did hard physical labor, the boss would hire them, the week ended, and the boss didn't pay them. Because there were thousands waiting in line to do that work. And it was against the law. There was no, the law said you have to pay people their wages. What changed that was, uh, I think in Illinois in the 1890s, they passed the law saying failure to pay wages is a criminal offense, still is. There were very few prosecutions, but there were enough and the failure to pay wages pretty much disappeared. This is a rare example of somebody passing a law that actually achieved a social change. And bear in mind the scale of the social change. This is pretty small potatoes. It's a very small part of the economy, a very small part of the workforce, and yet this is where the law had an influence. There's an old a thing that we used to do in the law, it's now archaic. It was archaic even though it was used when I still became a judge. It's from the 1850s and 1880s. You accuse somebody of feeding your horse poison oats. The horse dies, you sue him for the loss of the horse. And his answer is, this is the answer, we deny the allegation about poison oats and demand strict proof thereof. No one knows what that means, strict proof thereof. But it was a phrase that they used to use. I think it's a translation from the Latin. But it was traditional, and we always use this. Today, I think actually its one value is, it's a value for skeptics. Um, to the extent um, uh, that, uh, and, and you tend to love experiments, if you're like me. You're willing to take a flyer on lots of experiments, even if you think they won't work. Uh, and and I, I really don't like people who, hearing something, will tell you it doesn't work, and you say, how do you know this? And they give you a theory. I don't want a theory. I want experiments and I want facts. And I am a skeptic. And to the extent I have faith in anything, and all of this, I think, comes from the University of Chicago, it's faith in experiment. Uh, I have faith in testing. I have faith in the value of believing that you can and will be wrong, even when you are sure you are right. Okay. You'll have to forgive my voice, which has gone south somewhere. And uh, I also have a brand new cataract-free eye, and I'm just adjusting to that, so, and I'm too short for any podium, so I'm going to stay here. I was born and raised on this campus, so I'm a U of C lifer. Uh, 
Um, I came into the college from lab school in 1959 with a great background in German. And if there are other lab school people like Murray here, you may remember Herr Hagen. Herr Hagen was a fabulous German teacher. But I was now burning to learn Russian as soon as possible so that I could read War and Peace in the original. This was after a painful encounter when I was 14 with a Soviet anthropologist, a colleague of my father's, who was appalled to find me reading War and Peace in English. <laughs> my language teachers in the college, my Russian language teachers, were all native speakers of Russian, and they were marvelous, they were patient and persistent. Russian Civ, first quarter with Meyer Eisenberg. <coughs> Anybody remember Meyer Eisenberg? And uh, the rest, the second and third quarters, with Tom Reha. Anybody remember oh, Tom yes. Reha? Yes. Yeah. Sealed the deal. Reha, by the way, later, maybe some of you know this, disappeared in a mysterious way. He was a Czech emigre. It, very cold war. I believe his fate is still unknown. He disappeared probably into the Soviet sphere, and no one ever heard. It was very upsetting. By 1962, when I graduated, I was a committed Russian scholar, a member of the post-Sputnik generation. Does everybody remember Sputnik? Sure. Yeah. Good. Upon whom our government and the foundations lavished generous, really generous fellowships for graduate study, because they needed us so badly at that point. I became a librarian purely by accident. In the post-Sputnik years, universities needed librarians who knew Russian and Russian studies desperately. So at Michigan State University, where Harvey and I landed, Harvey's over here, uh, after two years in what's now Bangladesh, which is another whole story, I was declared a librarian by fiat, by the director of the library and the head of the Russian Center. At MSU and then at the U of Illinois in Urbana, where we stayed for 33 years, I found myself in an ideal situation as a scholar librarian, doing my own research and helping students and scholars do theirs. And I thought then and I think now, what could possibly be better than that? Since 1976, I've been studying censorship in Russia and in the Soviet Union. This was extremely challenging while the Soviet Union still existed because officially there was no censorship in that country and the authorities certainly didn't want someone like me digging around. But I did it anyway using resources available in the West and there were great resources available in our libraries in the West. Simultaneously, I found myself helping librarians and others, not only in Russia, but also worldwide, through the center I created at the U of Illinois <clears throat> in Urbana, to understand <clears throat> excuse me, the censorship and access issues they live with and to come up with strategies for dealing with them. We've worked together for decades to try and make things better. Now, I'm always the optimist. Drops in the ocean, my beloved Chekhov said. Yes, but those drops do make a little difference and are satisfying despite their minuscule scale. And we can't just sit there and wring our hands. And I expect most people in this room agree with me. Censorship and access are problems everywhere, and they're growing larger and more complex and more central to everything we do not only here, but everywhere in the world. Drops in the ocean notwithstanding, the world, I'm sure you'll agree, remains a mess, a real mess. You probably remember a song of our era, the Merry Minuet, which I would sing if I had a voice. Um, they're rioting in Africa, they're starving in Spain, you remember? Well, I always say to Harvey, I look at the paper, I say, it's still happening, change the name of the country, they're rioting, they're starving. Still are, so we need lots of people with degrees from the college. Strong critical thinking skills, languages, area studies, chutzpah, to wrestle with these problems and maybe resolve some of them. Thank you.
I assume <clears throat> that I'm on this panel because I've been teaching political science at Middlebury College since 1968. I teach political philosophy, American constitutional law, and American political thought. With the exception of one year spent in Washington, D.C. as a congressional fellow, I've spent my entire adult life in academic institutions, all as a student at Chicago and all as a teacher at Middlebury College, but for semesters as a visiting professor at Santa Clara University, Harvard, and Yeshiva University. Reflecting on the importance of my U of C education on my career and personal life, I cannot help thinking about my education from the third grade through my six years as a graduate student. What strikes me the most are the exceptional teachers I had, including Laura Oftedal in third and fourth grade, and Eunice Helmkamp McGuire, my high school English teacher at the lab school. Through Joseph Cropsey, who introduced me to political philosophy in my senior year at the college, and in addition to him, Leo Strauss and Herbert Storing, the teachers most important to me with whom I studied uh, as a graduate student. In addition, my fellow students were themselves a remarkable bunch. I confess that partly as a result of my living at home as a college student, many of my closest college friends were from high school. The atmosphere of college classes, especially those that were examples of the Hutchins College, encouraged active and probing discussion. I like to think that I bring that U of C spirit to life in my classes at Middlebury. <laughs> Recalling the experience of comprehensive examinations and the boast of some of my classmates that they would spend time at Wrigley Field and then ace their finals, I've never marked a student down for not attending class. My aim has always been to make the reading, whether it be great books or constitutional law cases, important, and then to engage the students in a discussion of that reading in class. Eva Bran, a longtime teacher at St. John's College and good friend, put it, puts it just right when she says that reading is in need of a seminar, that is, a class for discussion. I think we learned that at Chicago. I know that I received my love of learning and of teaching from my U of C education. Joseph Cropsey showed me and many other undergraduates what it meant to talk intelligently about inexhaustible texts in political philosophy. As a young college student, I found that my subject in my senior year. I was fortunate to pursue my education in graduate school in true leisure. And in Leo Strauss and Herbert Storing, I found two extraordinary teachers. Put aside all the talk about Strauss and neocons, most of which is uninformed. Strauss attracted students by teaching them how to read great books with care. His simple instruction was to try and understand a writer as he understood himself. Storing, who himself studied with Strauss, developed courses in the American Constitutional Founding and Lincoln and the Refounding that I and many other students of his have made a part of our teaching repertoire. The fields of political philosophy and American constitutional law are not as prominent now as they were in the 1960s, but they remain an important part of a college curriculum at most schools. At Chicago, for example, Nathan Tarkov teaches political philosophy in the Committee on Social Thought, and law school professors, including Jeffrey Stone, teach undergraduate courses in constitutional law. In reference to law, public policy, and society, I will close with one note about changes in American constitutional law. And I should note that there may be some comment on this from a, an Article III judge. <clears throat> the most prominent changes over the past 50 years, as I see them, have concerned federalism and the Supreme Court's enhanced scrutiny of regulations based on suspect classifications, such as race or gender, or restrictions on fundamental rights, such as privacy, autonomy. This has led to a spirited controversy over the place of the Supreme Court in the American system of government, which is likely to intensify in the weeks and months ahead. Since writing my master's thesis on the flag salute case, I've been interested in the proper relationship between judicial and political power under the American Constitution. Thank you. Thank you all. In terms of uh, panel engagement, I wonder if the judge wants to respond from the last. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, I, I actually agree with Murray about where the uh, issues have arisen. Uh, the, the one thing that I think is useful to understand about judges, uh, uh, federal judges in particular, we, we know we're appointed. We know we serve for life. Um, and we know we have enormous power. To, we can overrule the Congress and the President of the United States. Um, and if you took a look at the single most activist liberal federal judge in the United States, took a look at all of the opinions, you would find the vast majority of them were quite conservative because there is this restraint, unelected in a democracy with enormous power. Uh, what troubles people is the way judges reason from language in the Constitution, like the Commerce Clause, which has to deal with the federal government's power to regulate our lives. And, and in the face of the fact that when the country was founded, almost all of that power may not have resided in the states, but that was, that was where it was exercised. Um, what the difficulty most of us have is none of those phrases in the Constitution have a particularly defined meaning. Uh, you take a look at some of the Commerce Clause cases, the reach of the Commerce Clause seems logically ridiculous. Governing very minute things contained within one state, maybe even one village. But there are arguments for doing that. What you, what, where I think people derive most of their discomfort with the Supreme Court of the United States when it decides a liberal view or a conservative view as outsiders define it, because the judges have a different definition of both of those things. Um, the, somebody will say, well, if you look at the Constitution, it says X. And this is very clear that it meant something other than the Supreme Court said it did. That is never almost, I'd never a valid argument because it's not clear. It's left to the judges to interpret, and that's where their power is. And judges understand that in most cases they cannot point to a specific piece of language in the United States Constitution which says the decision should be X. It is their judgment. The criticism that is commonly made that judges say, well, look, we're umpires, we're referees. And the truth is we aren't. We make up the rules as we go along. And, in fact, this happens in baseball as well. <laughs> you know, for many years, they gave the pitcher a little more of the outside of the plate than they do now. And they thought that there was, was not only fair, it was also good for baseball because inside pitches frequently hurt people. That was a policy decision. Judges make them. And generally speaking, when we write our opinions, we sound as though they're not policy decisions drives people crazy. <laughs> but, but this is why there will always be controversy. This is also why most people think that there's an inherent political judgment in the court about going too far. And this is what causes their restraint. Because there is always the potential that the public as a whole for a long period of time will reject and lose faith in the court itself. But basically, the issues that Murray's talking about have been the big issues, and are likely to remain that way for quite some time. Speaking of baseball, um, one question I would ask of Murray is why the classmates he thought of were going to Wrigley Field instead of Comiskey Park. <laughs> but that's a different matter. Uh, he, he doesn't need to answer. Those who did that could answer. And between the panel, any, anybody want to raise anything with one another before we turn to the uh, audience? Yes, no, no. All right, why don't we, let me do this so we can, I can see people and call on you. We've got 20 minutes, and uh, let's just go around. Yeah. Uh, this is a question, uh, please, for either Mr. Dry or uh, Mr. Zagel. Uh, is one reason, or is, is it true that one reason there's so much controversy over the bearing arms statement of the Constitution <coughs> is that there, uh, I've heard there are three extant copies of the Constitution and none of them agrees on where the commas are placed. <laughs> You're the teacher. 
Um, I can't speak directly to the comma question. I don't, <laughs> I don't recall that. But I, I think uh, I can state the issue about which that, with which that's connected. Uh, see, did I? Usually, I carry a copy of the Constitution. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but which version? <laughs> I should have known. Um, the, uh, the Second Amendment begins with a preamble about the importance of the right to bear arms. And the, the question is how to interpret the preamble in light of the subsequent power. Uh, and the two major interpretations were that this was to guarantee the states uh, the right to regulate the militia against congressional control. And that was the dominant view until the Heller decision a few years ago, uh, which struck down Washington, D.C.'s uh, gun control law, especially the prohibition on ownership of handguns. Uh, and Justice, uh, Ju Justice Scalia wrote the court opinion finding a personal right to bear arms in that amendment. Um, and I, I think that meant he was reading the right to be broader than uh, the preamble, which would suggest limiting it to the protection of the states against Congress. Because until the 14th Amendment, it was understood, and the Marshall Court decided this in Barron and Baltimore, 1833, the original Bill of Rights only applied to Congress. So you had a number of arguments that would support the contention that this was a states' rights amendment. On the other hand, um, <clears throat> you, you could refer to the importance of the right to life in the Declaration of Independence as certainly implying a constitutional recognition of the right to bear arms as an individual right as a development of self-preservation, self-defense. And Sanford Levinson, a law professor at Texas, was one of the first to start uh, to make the case in the scholarly literature that uh, a full and fair interpretation of the Second Amendment uh, uh, required a finding that there was an individual right there. That's what the court did by a bare majority, and it was then applied as a fundamental right, applied uh, uh, to the federal government as well as the states. Some conservative jurists took Scalia to task on the grounds that they thought that was uh, not consistent with an approach to judicial review that took originalism seriously. Namely, they thought it wasn't so clear that that was the understanding. Um, I had a student do a wonderful thesis on this, and uh, my recollection was that his conclusion, and, and I shared it was, and this supports Judge Zagel, it just wasn't clear. It, 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 you just couldn't come up, I think, with a clear answer to the question mm -hmm. if you're just looking at the matter of Framer's intent. You had to somehow engage in a certain kind of interpretation. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll just close by saying it seems to me we could live with that decision as long as uh, a number of regulations of this right to bear arms are still upheld as constitutional. That's what we don't yet know about. Uh, although one could well make the case uh, for the, the it, it clearly is, in my view, a decision that could have gone either way. I, I don't know that the commas issue really would have settled it because they were aware of these two contending arguments about the relationship between the preamble and the subsequent statement of the right. Let me add, from my point of view of a judge, if I were to make a decision based on the placement of a comma, I would expect the vast majority of Americans would be thinking, if they thought about it at all, and asking the question whether it was nuts. <laughs> um, you, you can't do it on that basis. And, and some of it might have had to do with the fact that the D.C. law was the possibly the worst conceivable law, anti-gun law, that could have come to the U.S. Supreme Court. This is a law which said, yeah, you can have a gun, but if somebody comes in your house threatening to kill you, you can't use it to defend yourself. Where are you going to get with a law like that? It just has no public acceptance at all. And in fact, the minority said, I think tongue in cheek, that yeah, they do agree there's a personal right to have a firearm. So theoretically, it was a 9 nothing decision on where the right lay, and the decision was only about how you could regulate it. 
But this, this stuff you read in commentary about the Supreme Court, about what somebody did in 1842, and where the comma is, and what the word meant, if you look at an 1830 dictionary, really does not bear on the decision. Somebody could use it to bulk up an argument, but it's not a decision maker. All right. All right. Well, I want to take a risk, Diana. Oh. I've come to think, biologically, I have to say I'm a doctor, biologically there are no races. And I kind of think that one of the biggest problems of racism is that we still think that there are. There never was a white race until there was slavery. And the only reason for having a white race was so you were not black, that you were not a slave. <laughs> because we don't, people who are not black don't think of themselves as white at all. They think of themselves as whatever they are. And people who are not white don't think of themselves as black or Hispanic or whatever. You know, I should not say Hispanic is not white, but anyway, don't think of themselves as what they think of who they are. Well, if we stop seeing each other as races, we have less trouble. And I want your opinion about that. Okay. Because it matters a lot to me. Thank you so much. And I, uh, this is going to be a shorter answer. You'll just have to come to the reception on, <laughs> on June 2 for the longer version. But uh, I would, uh, we start this book uh, and by saying that the biologists have shown very clearly that there is no biological basis for race. OK, so we understand that, that this is an issue of culture and intergenerational transmission and uh, related values. And um, this uh, has to do with it. So that it's a social science uh, problem now. Um, however, the fact is that on an everyday basis, people operate on the basis of race. And so that means that if you are a uh, parent, or a family member, uh, then you have to um, train your child, educate your child, help your child, support your child, however you want to say it, to, uh, for them to be, uh, 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 to deal with uh, those kinds of issues. And um, uh, I, I think that we are living in a society right now in which we see people uh, very uh, wealthy and persuade, you know, positions, as well as people who are very poor, who actually fan the flames to intensify the idea that there are uh, significant and meaningful and enduring uh, race uh, differences from a biological standpoint. And uh, so long as those kinds of persons are around, then it is the responsibility of the culture and the society and the family uh, to protect the children uh, from what their inevitable experiences uh, will be as a result of that. So that's the, that's the dilemma. We happily know, at least for the last 10 to 15 years, that this has no basis in biology. But in the social sciences, it's very real and living and living large. And it's part of a, a culture that, uh, which is why sort of why I gravitated toward uh, human development um, you know, as a, uh, as a field and have been so interested in many ways uh, with this problem. And thank God have had students who have looked at this uh, very closely across time. But it's a hard um, pill for University of Chicago uh, graduates in uh, particular to swallow because I know that they never swallowed it while I was here. That's why I couldn't learn anything about it. And, uh, and I spent many years trying to, you know, getting information here and there and so forth and so on. Uh, so, you know, I, I would say that my education taught me to say, well, what is, what's, what's the elephant in the room, if you will, my Chicago education, that is not being addressed? And one of them, uh, one major elephant in the room that has not been addressed historically uh, is the issue of uh, racial stereotyping and how it affects people even when um, uh, even when, as of in recent years, we know that it has no uh, hard science basis whatsoever. So we're in agreement at one level, and then we're not in agreement 
um, you know, at the other level. And um, there are just too many kids out here who uh, suffer from uh, both nationally and, as I said, as I've learned internationally, from the effects of people acting as if there were, in fact, uh, these differences. So that's the context in which I've been uh, working. So I don't know if that partly answers. Leave it to my best friend to give me the hardest question. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I didn't, I didn't mean to give that impression. Although I can understand how you got it. Um, actually, I think that uh, in the academic world not only in this country, uh, uh, Strauss's reputation uh, is higher than it was when we were in school, and certainly than when I was in graduate school. Uh, his books have been read, have been translated in a number of languages. Um, I was referring to the status of political philosophy within political science departments. Um, I suppose in terms of the history of political philosophy, I would not, I would not identify that exclusively with Strauss, but he certainly did revive the serious study of uh, uh, political philosophers such as Plato and Aristotle. So that uh, it's likely that at certain schools, if they're doing a history of political philosophy course, and it starts with Plato and Aristotle, there may be somebody there who was influenced by Strauss. And if they start with Machiavelli or Hobbes, there's, some, uh, there's not. Um, <laughs> Since you asked the question, you give me a chance to note that um, my department has changed significantly since I was here. Um, they don't have the same range in approach to the subject that they did. Uh, when Herbert Storing left for the University of Virginia, he was not replaced. Uh, when Strauss left, of course, uh, somewhat earlier, uh, he was not replaced. Joseph Cropsey stayed on and had good relations with the rest of his department until I think he was teaching into his 80s. He's now retired, uh, uh, living in Washington with his daughter, Rachel. He's, he's almost my mother's age in his 90s. Um, but the, the, the department has, has uh, moved away from that. Uh, th that. That part of what Chicago, the political science department, had to offer, uh, it's not there. For many years, it was present with Alan Bloom and Tarkov in the Committee on Social Thought. Tarkov, for reasons I don't know exactly, moved from political science to social thought, so it's still present. Um, so, I mean, to conclude, uh, perhaps too long an answer. Many political scientists have become counters, quantifiers. Uh, certainly that's true in American politics, and that's why, I, I know that's why Harvard doesn't have anyone teaching public law. Uh, no tenured person has taught that subject since McCloskey in the 60s. Chicago goes across the campus, across the midway to, uh, to the law school uh, to get undergraduates taught constitutional law. Um, that's then a function of the, the predominance of a quantitative approach in political science, uh, especially at university departments. Hi, this is Mariana. Could you, I'm sorry about your voice, could you talk a little bit about, if you could, about the change in the whole censorship picture with, this, especially in Russia or Eastern Europe, wherever, with the advent of the internet and Google and the opening up of so much for us and how that's affected mm -hmm. what goes on here? Well, it's a very big and complex <laughs> question, of course. All of these a are. Little, a yeah, bit. a little, yeah. Um, the censorship that existed most recently, which was the Soviet model um, and was copied not by choice, but, you know, because it had to be by the other countries of the, that group, um, is gone. I mean, there's, there's no question about that. The, uh, it, it reached its peak under Stalin. It settled into a, 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 a equally brutal but much less visible uh, kind of status for, for, for much of the rest of the time and then gradually began uh, to change, had the period under Khrushchev in 19, right after Stalin's death for a decade when it looked like things were really going to shift and then it settled back. So that system, which itself isn't monolithic, uh, is gone. What's happened now is that when 
right after the changes, when Yeltsin was the president, even going back to Gorbachev at the very beginning of the changes, um, all of that crumbled first because it was decreed to crumble by Gorbachev. It was top down. And then under Yeltsin, it, it genuinely crumbled. And there was, for the first time, and people like me who were raised at the time we were raised, and I went three and four times a year to the Soviet Union, to Russia, post-Soviet Russia during those years. It was utterly amazing to watch things opening up and really a free press and free media and free speech and a cathartic kind of outpouring uh, of, of um, history, personal emotions in strange public settings and so on. Um, now that's gone. Now that's gone. And that is, you know, n nothing is simple, but I'll give you a very simple answer. Putin is a KGB officer. And the KGB ran the censorship during the entire Soviet Union under whatever name it bore at the time. He I don't make excuses for him, but he can't help it. I mean, that's who he is. He's put his buddies in all important positions. They have taken over the main national media. But what they haven't been able to do, thank goodness, because of the internet and because of cell phones and because of all these, all these things now, they haven't been able to cut off the free expression that you now see, and you know, I I, I believe that's terribly important, um, and I watch it closely. And so do a lot of other people. Um, it's 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 rather discouraging right now, and yet when I go there, when I talk with friends, and I'm there at least once a year, um, you can see how certain media are still doing just fine. They're just not on the national level, you know. And, and there, are a lot of, there are a lot of ripples and waves and so on here. Um, but that, that, I think, is the, the internet has been marvelous, just as it's been marvelous all in other countries in that respect. It turns out to be almost impossible to shut somebody up on the internet, thank goodness. <laughs> Any, this will be the last question. Um, as a lawyer, I find it very difficult to maintain my sense of reverence for the Supreme Court. <laughs> I, I try not to characterize as political decisions, but um, I'd like to bring your attention to Citizens United and ask the judge if he would apply what he said before about people's perceptions of decisions to that decision. Um, uh, Citizens United is um, the Citizens United is the case which said that expenditure expenditure limits uh, on basically on Americans in general are a violation of the First Amendment because they silence speech. And, and corporations. And corporations. Um, the the funny thing about that is is it's it's not unprecedented. The decision that said corporations were persons was pretty revolutionary and treated as a plain vanilla decision. It really isn't. Um, if you view, if, if you had this, if you originally came from a state in which you uh, had uh, great reverence for the Supreme Court of the United States on the grounds of its um, apolitical character, um, I think that you were wrong to have that view. Um, you, you can't really conceive of a Supreme Court functioning as a Supreme Court without making political judgments. Because they're human beings? Not necessarily because they're human beings, because they come to a place where the Constitution designed that certain issues get decided by the Supreme Court of the United States, plus they're human beings. <laughs> Those two things together made that inevitable. And the truth is, is uh, John Marshall 
did a startling thing, unprecedented thing, unprecedented really in jurisprudence anywhere, where he told both the sovereign of the country, the president, and the Congress, the legislative body, that uh, if we think your law conflicts with the Constitution, we're going to throw it out. Uh, that was a pretty big kind of political move. <laughs> and, and basically, what, what you want from the Supreme Court, I think, is not precisely the lack of this decision making, but y you are distressed, and, and many people are, by advocacy, mm -hmm. that a Supreme Court justice advocates a certain position. It's the reason why the right wing of American society was absolutely apoplectic about what, Justice Brennan. And if you read Justice Brennan's biography, that, that, that what they thought he was doing is what he was doing. Um, and uh, there's a recent article in The New Yorker about how Chief Justice Roberts maneuvered the Citizens United case. If you think that that kind of maneuvering is unique to his term as Chief Justice, you're just not, it's not correct. So what, what I think you have to do is operate on the premise that, uh, that there are lots of incentives, political incentives, that exist with respect to the Congress and the President of the United States that don't exist with respect to judges. And the decisions for that reason tend to be less influenced by political needs. And that's about the best we can do. And that is pretty effective. And bear in mind, you have people start out in the Supreme Court at position number one. By the time their turn is over, they're a long distance from that. And Hugo Black was one of them. Could I just add, in order to bring this back to the University of Chicago uh, and, and support uh, Judge Zagel about interpretation, uh, there were precedents on both sides in Citizens United, but I want to just briefly note that this question of money in politics in campaigns originated or arose fundamentally after the uh, uh, in Buckley versus Vallejo yeah. decided in 1976. Uh, this was Congress's attempt, Federal Election Campaign Act amendments of 74, to comprehensively regulate this. So expenditures and contributions were regulated. Uh, the Attorney General at that time was Edward Levy, and uh, he did what Attorney Generals normally do. Uh, he submitted a brief in support of the law. But then he did something unprecedented, I believe. He submitted on behalf of basically himself uh, uh, a friend of the court brief. <laughs> and two briefs, yeah? One in support of the entire law, and then an amicus brief yeah. On behalf of himself? Well, an amicus brief coming out of the Justice Department. Okay, first they support the entire law, and then they propose this Solomonic decision that a divided Supreme Court uh, embraced. Namely, uh, if it's your own money, for, if for your own speech, expenditures, no limits. But if you're giving your money to someone else, then it can be regulated. Now, that compromise you know, pr produced a majority, but there were justices on both sides. You know, some who said the thing is entirely constitutional, others who said the thing is entirely unconstitutional. I bring this up <coughs> to celebrate the University of Chicago and also <laughs> to suggest that, I mean, it, it, is a, it was an open question of constitutional interpretation what to do about this question of money and speech. I see it as it's the oligarch's free speech case. Most free speech cases are for Democrats. This, I'm using this in the Aristotelian sense. <laughs> Okay, the many and the few, the rich and the poor. This one was for the uh, the, the rich. There are, I think, problems, but but it, uh, just like with Bush v. Gore, there are constitutional arguments to support the, the way it came down. Now we have to deal with the results. I'd like to close with two quotations from Matthew Arnold. One is uh, reflecting back on our undergraduate years at this institution. Uh, we were introduced to the best that has been thought and uh, said through the ages. And I'd like to thank our panel for the sweetness and light, the uh, pleasure and enlightenment. <laughs>